Hey, this is Sean here with the Prepared Homestead, and this is day two of our stay-at-home order here in Idaho. And so we're making the best of it, and we're getting things done and, and working. I'm still working in my job, and I, I work remotely most of the time anyway. So that's great news, uh, but we're also getting some, some work done on the property and doing some planning and really feel strongly about, about helping people become a little bit more self-sufficient and, and not just because of everything that's going on. I, this is what we desire for people all the time and not just during a time of crisis. And I hope that this spurs people to develop a little bit more self-sufficiency in their everyday life. Okay. Everyday preparedness, not, not, um, you know, during a pandemic or during a disaster. Um, it's okay. If you're coming to that conclusion now, that's fine. And then I hope that you will develop that and maintain that from this point forward. Today's theme on day two is victory gardens. How can you become a little bit more self-sufficient? Plant a victory garden. And I'm gonna to talk to you real quick about the history of victory gardens. Victory gardens are, are often attributed to World War II in that era, but they actually began all the way back in World War I, at least in the United States, okay? And this is all countries pretty much have their own type of victory garden type of theme uh, throughout wartime. That was, it's very common. So the victory garden is not specific to the United States. Germany had, vic, you know, their uh, version of victory gardens during World War II, etc. Now, victory gardens were important in the United States because they took pressure off the food supply. They allowed the, that the government did not have to ration as much of supplies, okay, even though there still was some rationing. And it, it reduced pressure and it allowed people to be involved, okay? So that was a big part of it. It was it was a morale booster. People felt like they were contributing to the cure instead of um, being part of the problem, okay? And, and I'm not suggesting that in this case. What I'm suggesting to you is if you want to develop a level of self-sufficiency that you'll plant a garden. You can call it a victory garden or, or whatever you want, but that concept is is very apt right now. Uh, so planting a victory garden is, you know, for the effort, okay? And in this case, I think it's a sustained effort. We need to do it anyway. We've been trying to help people do this for a long time anyway. Uh, but now is a good time. So if, if uh, hopefully, this has woken up a lot of people to the fact that they might want to develop a little bit more self-sufficiency in their lives. So why? Why do you want a garden? It, again, it reduces pressure on that food system. We have an incredible system, a food system, a uh, supply system, supply chain management, <laughs> inventory management. We have an incredible system. And most large manufacturers, most of our food and most of our supplies, most of our toilet paper comes in a system, an inventory management system called Just-In-Time <laughs> Inventory. And the best companies in the world all use just-in-time inventory. And uh, you, you, we could get into the, uh, the history on that, but it, it's not important. It kind of comes from lean manufacturing and Toyota and, and some other things like that. But the bottom line is it is a system that basically has new products arrive as it's demanded. Okay, so in other words, instead of having large warehouses filled with toilet paper, Toilet paper arrives on the shelves as it runs out, but not all the time. Not all the time. Okay, so for example, Walmart, probably the best in the world at doing this, and many other companies are very good as well. They have a very intensive, detailed supply chain that um, uses inventory management just in time. And so they don't have stocks back in the back, right? We would say, oh, do you have any in the back? No, what's out on the shelves is what they have trucks show up and that truck is unloaded directly out into the shelves okay just in time okay and even if you go take that back a step as that truck goes to a distribution center a walmart truck for example goes to a distribution center and that truck cross decks directly from another truck a supplier so it'll go from a supply truck to a walmart truck to a shelf on a store just in time, okay? It's amazing. It's uh, very efficient. It saves a ton of money 
in inventory space and, um, you know, the renting, you know, no longer do these companies need giant warehouses to store their stuff because they use just in time. On the flip side of that, it becomes a very fragile system, or I should say a system that has a low probability of failing, except when it does, it can be catastrophic. Okay, so it can have um, a, a very high of consequences or vulnerability based on supply shock, demand shock, price shocks, things like that. So there's, there, you know, disruptions can throw that system out the window. Okay, as we've seen today, right? We we have a, a an increased demand in certain goods. Those things are stripped and they can't keep them in stock. Okay, even though our supply chain is still holding as of right now. Uh, but that might not always be the case. Okay, so the Victory Garden helps to um, guard against being de dependent on the grocery store. The fact that we have just-in-time inventory is amazing, keeps our prices low and all that, but it's vulnerable. Okay, it is vulnerable to shock, okay, as we are seeing now. So we want to develop resiliency and self-sufficiency, and part of that is growing some of our own food. Right in World War II, this is amazing. They got to a point where a third of all the fruits and vegetables grown in the United States were from home gardens. A third. That's amazing. Okay, that's that's a lot of people gardening. That's like all, all the schools were gardening, and uh, you know they were public places, private places. I mean, people were turning their yards into gardens, all that kind of stuff. And it's kind of ironic that. Nowadays, we, you know, you're not allowed to garden in your front yard in many places, um, considering all of that. Okay, so a third of all fruits and vegetables were grown in home gardens during that era, during the Victory Garden era. Okay, what is it today? I don't know. I couldn't find out, to be honest with you. But, it, but just common sense tells me that it is extremely low. It's probably somewhere around 5%. That's a complete guess. But I think about it like... Hey, I know a lot of people in a, that homestead or garden and that kind of thing. And even though those people who do grow some of their own food, when you really boil it down to it, when you start putting numbers on paper, they don't grow a huge percentage of their own fruits and vegetables. They might grow some or they might grow a lot of their a high percentage during certain times of the year, but not that many or, you know, canning and doing all that dehydrating and, and all that kind of stuff to last throughout a whole year. Okay, so our numbers are extremely low. So if you want to develop a level of self-sufficiency, plant a victory garden, right? So that's in our current context. What does it do for you? It builds self-sufficiency. It's going to give you confidence. Um, you are you are lessening the pressure on uh, our system. Okay, so that's a good thing, always. And um, you know you, you're going to get better food, right? So. The food that we get through our current food system, you know, you know, it's shocking to me, is that we will get blackberries from Chile or or Mexico when we can grow them here or get them, you know, regionally at least. Uh, but that's you know, it, it's cheaper in, in many cases to do it that way. But we shouldn't have to to do that. So if we grow a lot of our own food, we can get. Um, more nutritious food, so it's not it's not been stored for long periods of time. It hasn't have had to be shipped over long periods of time. Okay, so now what I'm going to talk to you about is just some very very basics about starting a victory garden. Okay, we we personally we grow a lot of our own food. In fact, for the last several years, we've been growing. I'd say, well, I don't want to say I'd say well, I know. Over 50% of all of our own caloric needs from our property. Now, that goes way beyond, you know, the Victory Garden. We grow all of our own meat and um, <coughs> eggs and all of that. Okay, so that's a big part of it too. However, this Victory Garden is a great place to start. It is a great place to start for um, self-sufficiency. Okay. We focus a lot on perennials, our planting. So we have a lot of fruit trees and nut trees and shrub berries, you know, that we that we grow. But we also grow a lot of vegetables, not just perennial vegetables and herbs and things, but 
annual vegetables that we grow during the growing season. So that's what I want to focus on because I think it's an easy place to start. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take you into where we have some starts going and explain to you a little bit about why we chose to uh, do it the way we do, right? Because there's a lot of different ways to do it.